good to see everybody here. Um, I just want to say uh, what a great time it was yesterday up here at the car show. You saw the pictures, but they didn't really even do it justice. It was just a blast. So much fun. And um, I couldn't get over how many people, I had my name tag on so they knew I was part of the team, and I couldn't get over how many people wanted to go out of their way to tell me, this is a great place, and these people are just so friendly. And I said, it's the way they are. <laughs> you know, so it was really just a delight to uh, be able to enjoy time with our friends in the community. And if you're here today uh, because you were here yesterday, uh, welcome. We're sure glad you're here. Uh, so glad that you came. And I trust that this will be a blessing to you this morning to be in and among uh, this body here. Um, speaking of, uh, from time to time, we'll ask an additional question uh, when we get to these connection cards that we've been talking about. You'll hear about it at the end of my sermon. And a few weeks ago, we asked a question about, do you, do you have faith gaps in your life? Do you have struggles with faith? And we got a surprising number of answers back to the point that we decided we should stop and just uh, change gear for two, gears for two weeks and really address the issue of faith and doubt. So that's where we are. Now, next week, I want to whet your appetite for the fact that we'll be in the book of Judges. We're going to start a series in the book of Judges for several weeks. And uh, last night, I was just preparing some stuff for next Sunday, and I wrote down these points that will probably show up in my sermon next week. And I hope these whet your appetite. Here's some takeaways when we, when we are looking at the book from an overview standpoint. We can learn from history or not. Much can change in just one generation. The consequences of sin are real and can be painful and prolonged. God is 100% faithful 100% of the time. Patterns in life are just that, patterns, so be aware of them. God can and does use flawed people in his flawless plans. And finally, God's plan is to use his people to impact the world around them for his glory. Man, this got me pumped up uh, when I was just trying to synthesize some of the things I've been seeing in the book uh, that we're going to be able to address these things uh, even beginning next week. So you don't want to miss that. That'll be a real encouragement. Uh, but today we're, but we're here pit stopped one final week for an examination of faith and doubt. And uh, again, if you're new around here, the way we roll here is that we really let the Bible be the primary voice up here. My job is really to just expose the Bible to you and to string together what the Word of God says. Uh, it's not my clever words, it's the Bible's words that matter. So that's what I'm up here doing. You'll hopefully observe that today. Um, and the Bible, we think, gives us a primary source for the, li the issues of life. That's where we turn to find what God has to say about the stuff in life. And so two weeks ago, uh, I was preaching on Psalm 16, and kind of did a little diversion into Mark chapter 9 about uh, the Father. It's today's Father's Day. And I'm thinking about the Father in Mark 9. He has this son who's really sick. And he's sick because he is in, possessed of, by a demon. And he's been possessed by a demon for years. And he's been thrown into the fire under the control of this demon. He's, his life is at risk. And Jesus is coming their way. And he cries out basically in, in desperation, I would guess, Lord, have mercy on us. If you can do anything, have mercy on us. And Jesus responds and says, if you can, anything is possible for one who believes. And then he says famous words that I think represent all of us at any given time. I believe, help my unbelief. I believe, help my unbelief. So it's easy to say, I believe all this stuff in my head, you know, I've got these Bible facts down, these Bible passages, I know what it says about who God is, but what happens when the rubber meets the road and things get tough? Do we still believe? And so we're going to just take a little bit of a, a journey 
into that. Before we do, let me open us in a word of prayer this morning. Father, uh, thank you for the time that we have today. And um, I remember my dad, who's with you uh, on this Father's Day. Thank you for him. Um, it's hard to believe, 2018. Um, and uh, I'm just so grateful that he had the impact on my life that he did. And really the biggest impact was he kept pointing me to Jesus. That's what he did. And so I, I've always said I'll never be as good as he was in it, but I just pray that today in what I'm doing, I can point people to, to you, Jesus. And so thank you that you've arranged life in such a way that there are fathers, and thank you that Jesus himself gave us this great example by saying, I don't do anything or say anything except what my father shows me and tells me. That's, that's what Jesus said in his ministry here on earth. And so I pray that we would be just like, like him in that, and we would trust in you, our Heavenly Father. Uh, you're always uh, right on time and right on path. And so thank you, Lord, for this time. I pray that uh, what we do say and think today would be pleasing to you. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So let me just give a quick review of where we were last week. I think it's important to kind of connect last week with this week. Last week was a little more of an exploration into kind of wrestling with faith and the, the creeping in of doubt. Today will be a little more of a what does life look like as we walk in faith. And so last week we looked at four R's, the reality of the world we live in. I'll get to that in a second. The reasons why we sometimes doubt. Uh, the recognition of what doubt is and what doubt is not. And then how can we rest in uh, trust and faith in the Lord? So the reality is this, and we're going to hear a lot from the Apostle Paul this morning. He wrote a number of books in the New Testament, and one of them was the book of Romans, and he wrote this in Romans eight twenty two through 25, for we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. So in the Garden of Eden, sin comes into the world and the ground is cursed, if you read the account in Genesis 3. And so really from that point forward, we know what the trajectory of the creation is, and that is decline until God someday makes a new heaven and a new earth. The same for us. We're groaning this side of our home. And so we groan in these bodies and we long for the redemption of our bodies. And he goes on to say, for in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. So that's a good reality check. We can pretend it's different, but God tells us the reality of things. The creation's groaning, we're groaning. Here's another reality, and this one's a little harder sometimes for me to accept. I, I can say it up here, but man, getting it into here to where I submit to it can be a different story. It says in Romans 11, three chapters later, verse 36, for from God and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Man, there's a lot in that verse right there. Is it about me? Is it about you? No, it's about God. Life here is about him. From him, through him, to him. That pretty well covers the map, doesn't it? And who gets the glory for all of it? He does, not me. Man, we get myopic, don't we? We get self-absorbed. It's about me. And then I look at my circumstances and I want them this way. But God says, from me, through me, to me are all things. And so it's good, uh, you know, I like, sometimes I want to go into pretend land and, and just believe that things are not what they really are and operate that way. But isn't it wiser to just operate according to reality? And it's good for us to see what God says is reality. We groan, we're waiting for our home, and God's in charge, and everything points to him for his glory. So realities. Now, why do we doubt? Do you remember them? Hope is dashed, 
and hope is deferred. The Proverbs talk about hope deferred makes the heart sick. Hope realized makes the heart glad. But hope dashed. What, how, are, how do our hopes become dashed? Two reasons, I think, primarily. First, what we do want to happen never does. That provision, that promotion, that recognition, that reconnection, whatever that thing is or those things are, we want them to happen and they never do. And so then our hope falters, our trust falters. And I put the word expect in there because again, maybe I'm the only loser here in the room who does this, but sometimes I turn my wants into my expectations. I want something to happen and I just start to expect it was going to happen. And then, whoa, when it doesn't, that's a problem. That's tough. The other one is on the flip side of the coin, and you could probably think of examples, maybe even are facing examples in your own life. What we never want or expect to happen does. That tumor that comes, that tragic event that occurs, that unexpected loss that happens. What we never want to happen does. And in both cases, they're kind of the flip sides of the coin, but they, in both cases, it can cause us to begin to doubt, begin to say, God, are you there? Do you care? And again, it's good to remember realities about who is it for, through, to, from, him, etc. And then recognition. Two things that are important about doubt. First, doubt is normal. We see a famous example of that in Scripture with John, uh, excuse me, Th- the Apostle Thomas, the disciple Thomas. Thomas doubted. He said, if, unless I see the, hands in it, the holes in his hands and the hole in his side, I will never believe. He's super resolute about it. And then he sees Jesus a few days later, and Jesus doesn't upbraid him. He doesn't scold him. He says, he leans into him and he says, here, put your hand here, put your hand here. And he says, blessed are those Thomas who have not seen and believed. That's you and me. You know, we didn't walk the face of the earth with Jesus at that time, but he's calling us to trust him. And our, I I should just, before I forget our hope and our trust is in a person. It's not in something other wise ethereal or, or, or mushy. It's in, a, it's in a person. It's Jesus. It's in Jesus. Our hope is in him. And then secondly, doubt is not settled unbelief. It can become that, but it's not settled unbelief. If you nurse your doubts, if you wallow in your doubts, they can become markers of settled unbelief. And so I just want to encourage you, and that's why I've been encouraging last Sunday, and I'll encourage again today. Don't doubt in isolation. Eric Bryan's tagline, nothing ever good has happened to me in isolation. Nothing. I've never done anything good in isolation. Isolation's a bad place to be. And so I want to encourage you to lean in. I want, to, I want this community of believers here to be the kind of people where we can be open about our doubts and just talk about them courageously. And then he, the writer of the Hebrews said, holding fast the confession of our faith, spurring one another on to love and good works, having the perspective of until the day draws near. These are the kinds of things we do together as members of the body of Christ. So doubt is not settled in belief, certainly when you're doing it in community. And then finally, resting. I had to pick just high points from what we talked about, but resting, the Apostle Paul back in 1 Corinthians 15 says this, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scripture that he was buried. And I said last week, if, it, if the period happened there, that's a problem. That's hopeless. But it doesn't stop there. It says, and Jesus was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. That's the ultimate hope we have is in a person, the risen Jesus Christ. And you're going to see a thread here of the importance of the resurrection for our hope and our trust. Now, I gave us an image to think about last week, and I said I was going to carry it through these two weeks. Um, look at this. Uh, somebody pointed out in first, after first service, look at the uh, catcher there on the left. 
Is it on the left? Yeah. He doesn't even put his hands out until right on time, right on time, every time. This is an idea I got from a book I was reading called Faith and Doubt by John Ortberg, and he talked about Henry Nouwen, uh, a guy who's done a lot of writing about the spiritual life, and he spent the last year of his life uh, on sabbatical, and one of the things he did was to take up with a trapeze troupe called the Flying Roadleys. And he learned from the roadlies that flyers fly and catchers catch. Flyers get the glory. They're the ones letting go and doing the somersault. Catchers are the heroes of the show. So you fly or you catch. And we're in the business of letting go of the trapeze, trusting God to fly. And we fly. And every time he catches us, every time. The joke in the book was, and he doesn't have sweaty hands, right? The catcher. So he's right on time. And so sometimes life feels this way. It feels unstable. It feels unpredictable. It feels like, is he there? Will he catch me? And my encouragement to us is that Scripture bears this out. And experience as we walk with the Lord will show us that, um, yes, he's there. He catches us. So, Today, we're going to look at four ultimates. We're going to talk about ultimate hope, ultimate power, ultimate blessing, and ultimate living. And really, the first three kind of are ground for the fourth. We have ultimate hope if we're in Christ. We have ultimate power if we're in Christ. We have ultimate blessing that we can share with others if we're in Christ. And that all leads to living a life that looks like ultimate living. I've used the phrase in Christ more than once here today. Do you know what it says in Second? I was sharing with our friends yesterday at the car show. They wanted me to share a brief message of the good news. And I thought about car examples. And I said, okay, there's two examples about cars. I, when I first pulled up yesterday, I saw some people who had these like hand buffers. I mean, lint rollers, perfection. Like, it, like every little eyelash was off of that car. It was so pristine. And I said, on one side of the coin, you can do all you want to do and all you can do to make this thing as pretty and fancy and gussied up as as you can make it. You can tune this thing to the highest performance possible. And that's sort of like us before God. We can do all that work and it's never going to be good enough to save ourselves. It's never going to be good enough because we're sinful And we need a substitute that can be satisfactory to God. And that's where I quoted the verse from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, which goes something like this. For God the Father made Jesus the Son to be sin on our who knew no sin on our behalf, so that in him, in Jesus, in Christ, we might become the righteousness of God. When we stand before God, if Jesus, has, has, if his work has saved us, if we've trusted in Jesus and not our own work to save us, then we stand before God righteous. Not because I'm righteous, not because you're righteous. We stand in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And he looks on his son and he says, I'm satisfied in him. Isn't it good to be in him then? Because <laughs> anything else is inferior And won't get the job done. But being in Christ means we can stand before God in his righteousness. So the flip side of my illustration was, but once I I met a lot of car owners yesterday who took cars that literally weren't running and had rust falling off of them when they got them. And man, you had to see them to believe them yesterday. They looked amazing. They were running great. They looked great. And I said, that's Also, what he does when he saves you, he takes you from dead and he makes you alive and he grows you into looking more and more and more like Jesus Christ. So those are the two wonderful sides of the coin of salvation. So first, let's talk about ultimate hope. How can we live with ultimate hope? What what is the reality of living with ultimate hope? And it says, if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it's true that the dead are not raised. 
For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Paul sometimes goes on these trails that are wonderful, masterful defenses of the faith. And he's saying, if th- let's just take a scenario. If none of this is true, what's the picture look like? And let me tell you what the picture looks like. Hopeless, bleak. He goes on to say, then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished, meaning died in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. We're like the train wreck at the side of the road that everybody can't take their eyes off of and go, oh, that's so pitiful. We've put our hope in something that is not true and someone that is false. But, 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 in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. There's the linchpin of our faith right there. Jesus is alive. And he's the first one to rise and we will come in succession behind him if we are in him. He goes on to say, or excuse me, his contemporary Peter said it this way in 1 Peter 1, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials. This is our life. So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him, Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. You see that continuum that we live along? We're journeying home, and our trust is in a person who's prepared the place for us. We're not home yet, but we, we hope, ironclad hope, in what has already been provided through Jesus then 2 Corinthians four sixteen through 18 says this, so we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. So if you were here first service, you're a glutton for punishment to hear me twice, but if you were here, you saw me lose it as I read this passage. Usually doesn't happen two times in a row. I get it out of my system. But first service, I read this, and immediately thoughts of my mom came into my mind, who died of a long long battle with dementia. And now my mother-in-law, Cheryl, has Alzheimer's advancing in her life. And I remember looking at my mom especially past the point when she was really engaged and communicative at any significant level. And I said to myself, and I had to say to myself, Lord, you've got an amazing communication thing going on with my mom right now. Because on the outside, her, she's decaying and wasting away. But you know what I, my hope is in? That on the inner person, she is being renewed day by day. I used to think, man... What a personal, customized communication she and the Lord are having that she knows and she's super cognitive about in the way he's talking to her. Isn't that cool? Isn't that hope-filled? That's what we have to place our trust in is that God's got a bigger plan. He's working it out. Because what I see with my eyes Doesn't look so good, but you know what? I got to remember it's transient and the things that are unseen are eternal. We have ultimate power, ultimate power. And this is not just hyperbolic language. It's real language. When I say ultimate power, listen to what I mean. I have been crucified with Christ if I'm in Christ. 
It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Listen to what it says in Romans 6, 4, and 5. We were buried therefore with him into bab- by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Ultimate power. We've been raised with Christ. And then finally... I love this one, especially in our daily walk of waging war against sin, of following Jesus. Look what it says in Romans 8, 10, and 11. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, get this, if the spirit of, of, Jesus, of, the, of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, that's the Holy Spirit, he's in us if we're in Christ, then he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Isn't that amazing? That's what I would call unlimited power source right there, raising Jesus from the dead. We live in that ultimate power. And then we have the opportunity to be an ultimate blessing to others, to to convey God's ultimate blessing to others through what we say, and through what we do. Look what it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 20 and 21. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. There's our verse again. So we have the opportunity to be his ambassadors. Ambassadors don't carry their own message or their own assignment. They're given their assignment from their authority, and they just represent the authority. So as one who is in Christ, I'm an ambassador. And that's part of what I'm doing here today. And folks, friends, if you're here and you have not trusted Jesus as your Savior, I hope by now I've shared enough to say to you, you can't do it on your own, and I can't do it on my own. There's no way I can save myself. No way. Scripture is very clear about that. But Jesus came and died for all. And for those who trust in him and say, not my work, but your completed work, to trust him for salvation, to save them from the penalty of their sins and to give them life eternal, then those are people who are in Christ. So I want to encourage you to run to Jesus today. We've got a box on our connection card that says, I want to learn more about a relationship with God, I think it says, or a relationship with Jesus. It's right under the next steps. Check that box and let us know. We'd be delighted to con- uh, connect with you. Now, it's not only what we say, it's what we do. Jesus himself said in Matthew 5, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Uh, You know, part of what made me smile about the car show yesterday is I think this is a verse that we could have pinned on that show yesterday right there. Our light shone beautifully to our friends in the community yesterday. And our, our, our goal, and Jay said it before, I've said it before, we do those for one reason, and that is to engage with people at the end of the day and win the right to be able to share the good news of Jesus with them and to invite them into this great journey with Jesus to come and grow in Christ. That's why we do what we do. And so we have the opportunity to convey God's ultimate blessing to others in what we say, in what we do. And then the last one, I'm staring at my friend Mike Cunningham on the aisle out here, and he taught me this in 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 7. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our afflictions so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's suffering, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. 
Here's the punchline he taught me. If we're afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. He's like, what I'm going through isn't for me, it's for others. It's kind of a hard pill to swallow. You kind of, again, we're self-absorbed, right? But the scriptures are super clear about it. There's no trick words in this verse. If I'm afflicted, it's for others, comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it's for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. One of the poignant, sweet things about being a a son of a mom who who ultimately lost the battle to that uh, cognitive decline is that I can come alongside other people, right? That's what it's for. So these are ways that God has blessed us to be ultimate you get to convey his ultimate blessing to others. So why do we still doubt? Last week, it was a pretty popular thing I did. I read this uh, passage from the book, uh, D- A Disappointment with God by Philip Yancey. We, are, we still doubt because of those two things. We, what we do want to happen never does, and what we never want to happen does, right? Listen to what Yancey says, and he kind of, uh, again, takes a big a big view perspective on this. He talks about the fact that we see things, we think the world is what we can see, but really the, the realer, the more real world is what, the, is what the unseen world is. And that's where God operates uh, so often. And so it says here, he goes on to say, miracles serve as signs pointing on to the future. They are appetizers that awaken a longing for something more, something permanent. And the happiness of Job's old age was a mere sampling of what he would enjoy after death. The good news at the end of Job and the good news of Easter at the end of the Gospels are previews of the good news described at the end of Revelation. We dare not lose sight of the world God wants. This next paragraph, he had told a story about his friend, Meg Woodson, who lost both of her children to cystic fibrosis, one at 12, one at 23. So when you hear her name, you'll know. The promise of Job 42, then, is that God will finally right the wrongs that mark our days. Some sorrows, the death of Job's children, for example, or the deaths of Meg Woodson's children, never heal in this life. No words of solace can assuage the grief in Meg Woodson's heart, for that grief has a precise shape, the shape of her daughter Peggy and her son Joey. But at the end of time, that grief, too, will vanish. Meg will get her daughter back and her son remade. And if I did not believe that, did not believe that Peggy and Joey Woodson are right now breathing in great gulps and dancing and exploring new worlds, then I would not believe anything and would have abandoned the Christian faith long ago. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. And then he goes on to say at the end of his little passage here, in any discussion of disappointment with God, heaven is the last word the most important word of all. Only heaven will finally solve the problem of God's hiddenness. For the first time ever, human beings will be able to look upon God face to face. In the midst of his agony, Job somehow came up with the faith to believe that, quote, in my flesh I will see God, I myself will see him with my own eyes. That prophecy will come true not just for Job, but for all of us. So then, with this hope and this power, we go on to ultimate living. And Paul again writes in Romans 8, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose... For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he also called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Again, that pathway from the call to salvation clear through to glorification when we are with him. That's where we live. Sometimes it's hard. Psalm 13 is one of my favorites, not because it's super flowery and fancy and happy. Most of it's not. The psalmist David is talking about how long, long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? 
And he said, there's a phrase in there that said, how long will I take counsel in my soul? It's kind of that downward doom spiral of, oh, it's horrible. Where are you, God? I'm beginning to doubt. And I learned in the Psalms that there's something called an affirmation of trust, a pivot point that so often comes in those Psalms. And here's what it says. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. And then the same is true. We saw it with Job. I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth, and after my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. And just a freebie, do you want to know what the next phrase is in that passage that I have up on the screen, the one I didn't put up there? Part B of 27 says, my heart faints within me. That's a, I believe, help my unbelief statement right there. <laughs> So, but he's honest about it, and he says, I, I got, I've got to believe I know that I will see him someday. My Redeemer's alive. He lives. What a great, hopeful, prophetic statement Job made. So, life's like this, isn't it? We've got to let go of that trapeze. That flip feels like it's not going to complete sometimes. But the catcher puts his hands out at always on time, on the right, at the right time. His hands aren't sweaty. He's always on the mark. He's ready to catch. And so, to just wrap all this up, if we have ultimate hope, ultimate power, ultimate blessing that leads to ultimate living, here's a couple of final encouragements for you. Therefore, Hebrews 12 says, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. And then finally, Galatians five sixteen and 25 but I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. And a verse I've struggled with to know what it meant for so long, and then I realized, I think I was just overcomplicating it. Verse 25 says, if we live by the Spirit, which is really Paul saying, this is the real reality you do if you're in Christ, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. And that's nothing more than submitting to his walk. Get in line. With his, with his pace, with his path. Let's grab our connection cards and wrap this up, folks. Um, on the back of your card, you'll see something that says, please pray with me that I will, and it's got a few next steps. Uh, we pray for these, and I want to encourage you to share them with us so we can pray for them this week. Certainly jot down any additional prayer requests. And like I said last week, after we collect these, don't leave because we're going to sing a song that really reinforces all that we've worshipped about today, about uh, this journey of faith that we're on. Um, so the first is, please pray with me that I will build my hope in God's faithfulness. He will catch me. So do you believe that you can build your hope in God's faithfulness? He will catch you. Next is increasingly rest in God's power. He will carry you. Next is share God's love with others. He gives life. And finally, and this one's hard, daily let go of the trapeze. I like to just stay on the trapeze and keep swinging, right? It's predictable. It seems safest. But the safest place we can be is we do the flying, he does the catching. Every time he catches, he will catch. So let's take a minute to complete these together. you all. Love you. God bless you.
Thank you so much, Pastor.